completed her medical degree at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia in 1994 after earning her Bachelor of Arts degree in 1990, also at UVA. She completed her family practice internship at David Grant United States Air Force Medical Center in California in 1995 and her general surgery internship at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina in 2000 where she continued on to complete her orthopedic surgery residence, residency in 2004. Dr. Treacle, that's correct, then completed a hand and upper extremity fellowship at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston, Massachusetts in 2005. As an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Treacle specializes in problems of the hand, wrist, forearm, and elbow. She is an expert in diagnosing and caring for condition affecting these areas and is focused on returning her patients to active pain-free lifestyle. Dr. Treacle is a member of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Society for Surgery of the Hand. She is certified by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery and has earned her certificate of added quali qualification in surgery of the hand. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please welcome Dr. Carrie Treacle. Ken, I appreciate that, uh, that introduction. It makes me sound more impressive than I am. <laughs> Next slide, please. I also appreciate the uh, introduction because it leads me into a joke. <laughs> My maiden name was Miller. Oh, I need to stand, stand here. My maiden name is Miller. And then I married into the triple name. And my husband was very, very happy that I took his name, because uh, these days it's kind of hit or miss whether, whether wife does that. I was a Dr. Miller, and then became Dr. Treeple. And I learned, Treeple's not so easy. It's Treeple, Tripoli, Tripel, and I have a, a local patient who taught me a nice way to teach, teach patients how to remember my name. And I'm just gonna shout. Here's the church, here's the steeple, look inside and see all the Treeples. <laughs> right here, it works out perfectly. Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door and infuriate the people. <laughs> I have four kids, that's why the look inside and see all the treeples is also kind of funny. Now, in trying to decide what to address in 20 minutes, that's hard. Obamacare is big. How can you boil down a 3,000 page document in 20 minutes? I could talk about the fact that the Supreme Court is going to be hearing the case of 14 days. We could touch upon religious freedom. I don't have time for all of that. I'm going to discuss basically three points that I like to drive home. First is the money involved with Obamacare. Second, the motives behind Obamacare. And third is an answer, not necessarily the answer, but an answer that is out there. Next slide. The money. <coughs> I'd like to start with a quote from James Madison in the Federalist Papers. It will be of little avail to the people that the laws that are made by men of their own choice, if the laws be so voluminous that they cannot be read or so incoherent that they cannot be understood. Perfect introduction to Obamacare. Depending on the font that's used, we're going to guesstimate 3,256 pages of legislation. Now I pick up my Bible, that's two of my Bibles put together. It's the largest expansion of federal bureaucracy in the United States history. There are 159 new commissions, boards, committees, get-togethers, 4,000 new health care regulations, 150,000 new federal employees, 16,500 of which will be assigned to the IRS. And of course, the individual mandate, which will be heard in approximately two weeks in the Supreme Court level. Next slide. Our current health care arrangement is pretty simple. You have your patients, you have your physicians, and you have your allied health care professionals, such as the therapists, and so on. You have your payers, both public and private. And let's take a look at what's going to happen once Obamacare is fully implemented. This is what we've got. You can see in the very center, the largest circle is the Secretary of Health and Human Services. 
and we'll discuss Kathleen Sebelius a little bit more as we get into the talk. <laughs> but these are the 159 new boards, committees, regulations, and you can see how they all feed into the Secretary of Health and Human Services. <coughs> Next slide. No, sorry. <laughs> That's good. Jimmy was studying it intently. It's awesome. I love it. It's like a circuit board. It is. That's exactly what it is. And if anybody wants a copy of this talk, I'm happy, happy to distribute it. So in order to discuss Obamacare, we have to look at Romney Care, because really, that was used as a template for Obamacare. <coughs> Next slide. Obama, excuse me. Romney Care was passed in 2006 short-term implications in Massachusetts. Over a five-year interval between 2003 and 2008, the United States saw an increase in health care premiums of 33%. What about Massachusetts? Massachusetts outpaced us 40%. Okay, so 33% in the United States, 40% for Massachusetts. What else do you get for that increased cost? You get longer wait times. OBGYN, the wait times went from 45 to 70 days, and if you're waiting to see somebody like me, I hope you didn't break anything because your wait's going to go from 24 to 40 days. It makes sense that this increased wait time to see specialists leads to increased utilization of emergency departments. We all know that emergency departments, that's the most expensive care you can get out there. Even Democrat Timothy Cahill the treasurer for Massachusetts at the time, could see what the intent was. He said, instituting Massachusetts health insurance reform nationwide will threaten to wipe out the American economy within four years. Our experiment has nearly bankrupted Massachusetts and only federal aid is sustaining the program. We're being propped up so that Obama can drive a similar plan through Congress. So, short-term implications for the states. Medicaid is often a leading budget item within the states. What Obamacare will do is it's going to increase the number of Medicaid patients by 18 to 24 million. And by the end of the decade, that number is estimated to be closer to 84 million. Now, states only receive two years of federal subsidy, and then what happens? Either way, whether it's federal funding or state funding, the money is taxpayers that are, that are paying for it. Now, physicians only get reimbursed 60 cents on the dollar for the cost of taking care of a Medicaid patient. So, that is not a sustainable business model. We still are required to pay our employees. We're still required to pay our, pay our electricity. Yet for a Medicaid patient, we get paid 60 cents on the dollar for our costs. So you can see what's gonna happen here. In order for a physician to maintain their practice, they're gonna have to limit or eliminate the number of Medicaid patients that they see. This is gonna to lead to more emergency room costs. Next. Long-term implications of Obamacare. It is designed to fail. The Secretary of Health and Human Services decides what will be covered. The feds will regulate the insurance premiums. And there is an intentionally low penalty, tax, whatever you want to call it, if you don't participate. So a patient can wait till they get sick automatically get an insurance policy, and as soon as you're well, opt out. Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of thought to know that this just doesn't work as a, just purely as a business model, just purely looking at the dollars. As a result, insurance companies are gonna collapse, they're already leaving Massachusetts, and this is going to lead to a single payer system, which has always been the goal of Obamacare. Next, we're going to discuss the motives. We're there. Yep. <laughs> Again, I'd like to start with another quote, much more lengthy. Hey, Benjamin Franklin, well worth it. Your mother is with me. Your mother is with me. To, to relieve the misfortunes of our fellow creatures is concurring with the deity. It is godlike. But if we provide encouragement for laziness and supports for folly, may we not be found fighting against the order of God and nature which perhaps has appointed want and misery as proper punishments for and cautions against, as well as necessary consequences of idleness and extravagance, 
Whenever we attempt to amend the scheme of providence and interfere with government of the world, we had need be very circumspect, lest we do more harm than good. Let's meet some of the folks who are behind <coughs> instrumenting Obamacare. We have Donald Berwick. He was a recess nomination to head CMMS. He has a professed love affair with the British national health care system. He has described it as a seductress about which he is romantic. I think that's a little strange. And the British health care system is the third largest employer of the world. Now, two questions. Do they have the third best health care in the world? I know we've all known people who have waited in the, in the United Kingdom for health care. Second question, do they have the third highest population? No. So you've got a bloated bureaucracy administering poor medicine. Okay, next slide. So Donald Berwick realized that he was a polarizing figure and he resigned. Marilyn Tavener has been appointed to take his place. She was the Secretary of Health and Human Services of Virginia under Tim Kaine. And she has already said, I'm not changing a thing that he's doing. So all that we have in the transition from Donald Berwick to Marilyn Tavener essentially is a change of chromosomes. Next slide. <laughs> Speaking of chromosomes, Kathleen Sebelius, Secretary of Health and Human Services. She is the second most powerful figure in the country. We can't kid ourselves about it. Now, she is the former executive director of the Kansas Trial Lawyers Association. So, what I want to know is how I get the position to tell the trial attorneys how to do their jobs. Because that makes just about as much sense as a trial attorney telling me how to take care of you. Okay? Plain and simple. She and her 159 boards, commissions, agencies are going to determine what meets the definition of quality and the standard of American health care. She will determine, determine minimum essential coverage and is the sole authority to establish patient treatment and eligibility protocols. She's going to oversee the implementation and enforcement of Obamacare, which is very concerning. I don't know if any of y'all saw the recent grilling that Senator Johnson, I believe from Wisconsin, was speaking to her on Wednesday about Obamacare ramifications and costs. and. It was concerning because she really stumbled and bumbled and didn't answer a thing. Next slide. I've often been questioned, is this really going to result in the rationing of care? The answer simply is yes. These three boards that you see listed on the slide are going to be the official agencies to do so. Next slide. The first, and I have to stare at the slide because it's such a long gobbledygook name, Federal Coordinating Council for Continuing Research. This is the rationing board. What, now the first thing to look at is the fact that this was not created with Obamacare. This was actually created during the stimulus bill that was passed in 2009. It's a 15 member politically appointed group that was assembled within 72 hours of passage of the stimulus bill. What this group looks at is a formula called comparative effectiveness. This is very similar to what's used in Britain. So quite simply, you'll take the cost of treatment divided by the number of years of benefit. So if your cost is too high or you're not expected to live too long, your ratio is not going to be in your favor. I have twins that were born two months early. I'm glad they were born before a ratio could tell me what was going to happen to them. Next, we have the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. This is the enforcer. There is a big push requirement 
for all physicians to go on electronic medical records. It's been sold to us that we need to do this because it's going to facilitate patient care, make it smoother, make it better. In certain aspects, certain aspects it does. Certain aspects it does not. But if you look behind, what I feel one of the big and main reason that we're required to go on electronic medical records is so that this board can and will guide the medical decisions at times and place of care. So if I enter something wrong into your electronic medical record when you come to see me for carpal tunnel syndrome, then guess what? I won't be able to take care of you. I won't be able to do a simple $200 operation to fix you because I entered the wrong thing in the computer and the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology says no. Physicians and hospitals who are not meaningful users will face penalties and these include being excluded from these insurance exchanges, fines, and prison. Next slide. The third board and this has received a lot of attention in our medical press. It's been the Independent Payment and Advisory Board. There's actually legislation moving through Congress to attempt to repeal it at this time. This is an unelected and politically appointed board, which should concern us all, designed to develop proposals to reduce per capita growth in Medicare spending. Now, Obamacare cuts $586 million from Medicare right away. Now we've got this board to reduce the spending even further. This is not going to impact our citizens greater than 65 in a positive way. IPAB will determine the covered services and fees. There's no congressional oversight. It cannot be challenged by the courts. Now where is the balance in the power of this board? Everything can be challenged by the courts or in the courts. This apparently cannot. Anyone can go down and File a lawsuit. Okay. <laughs> then I stand corrected. <clears throat> I'm going to look at supply and demand. Every year, we have 25,000 medical students graduating from school. They get their MD. Currently, we have 35,000 physicians per year retiring. That creates a net loss of 10,000 physicians per year. Multiply by 10. And in the next decade, we're going to see a loss just based on graduation and retirement of 100,000 physicians. Combine this with the fact that 65% of physicians are opposed to Obamacare, and I think probably the other 35% are too busy to have read it and researched it to see its implications. And Barack Obama is going to add 32 million patients with Medicaid because if any boomers will experience an increase in Medicare um, patients by 30%, you have your cut to Medicare of 586 billion, your critical shortage of physicians, and then you have the IPAP decisions. There's no way that there will not be rationing. Next slide. And next slide. I'm a physician graduated in 1994. She gets further and further away every day. I care about the uninsured. I haven't turned away patients who show up in my office with fractures or any other condition based on insurance or lack thereof. It's just not the way or the reason that almost all of us went to medical school. This is what we care about. And if there's a way to improve the insurance for, for or the, excuse me, the health care, not insurance, the health care for the uninsured, I'm all for it. So let's start by just briefly, briefly looking at who the uninsured are. We've got a pie chart here. The upper half and lower half are basically two different um, sides of the same pie. So if you look down below, at the lower three slices, the lower right hand, the green, Individuals earning more than $75,000 per year, $9 million. That's 19% of our uninsured. So those are patients who could, who could buy insurance, but just choose not to. Bottom central pie, the purple one. There are 9.7 million who are eligible for government programs. That's another 20% of the uninsured. And we'll move one on over to the left. 
There are six million patients who are eligible for employer-sponsored insurance who choose not to get it. That's another 13%. So out of the 47 million uninsured, half of those have access to insurance and choose not to participate. That's around 23 million. Now if you look at the top half, you have your Americans without affordable options, that's 12, 12 million, important figure. Illegal immigrants, 5.2 million, and legal immigrants, 5 million. Next slide. <coughs> so, 12 million patients, 12 million, 12 million Americans are chronically uninsured. They do not have affordable options, 12 million. 85% of Americans have been satisfied with their current insurance, and even a CMS analysis in April 2010 says that in 2019, after full implementation of Obamacare, there will be 23 million patients who are still uninsured. How does that solve the problem? I think we've added 159 new boards, regulations, committees, we've cut $586 million from Medicare, we've imposed rationing, and we still have 23 million that are uninsured. It doesn't solve the problem. It adds an unfathomable level of bureaucracy and cost, and it doesn't change the level of the uninsured at all. Next slide. So, the summary of this portion, American health care is the envy of the world, not American health insurance, American health care. Our political leaders are manipulating and ignoring the facts to, to achieve their goal of a single-payer single system. And this breaks two problems for reform. It fails to achieve universal coverage, and it fails to bend the cost curve down. Why is this being forced upon us? Because I think it's the next logical step towards socialism. There's, there's a wonderful speech by Ronald Reagan in 1961 where he talked about socialized medicine and how it is a stepping stone to socialism. I urge you all to YouTube it. It's wonderful. It's only 10 minutes. Okay, next, I'm going to talk about the answer. Am I doing okay on time? How much? Okay. I actually cut a lot for my talk. Next. <laughs> next. Best slide right there. I just go through the next three. So I briefly wanted to just kind of nod my head to this grassroots organization of which I've become involved called Docs for Patient Care. And basically, we were founded in May of 2009 when we saw Obamacare's health care plan on the table. And we, we intend to supplant the AMA as the voice for physicians and patients. 17% of physicians belong to the AMA. Many are retired, many are medical students. They don't speak for the rest of us. <clears throat> Doctors and patients are capable of making the most informed, personal, and accurate decisions, not a federal, a state government, or a board. There are three R's of sustainable, blah, 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 sustainable reform. The first, malpractice reform. The second, insurance. And the third, a little healthy dose of personal responsibility on the behalf of patients. Next slide. Tort reform, conspicuously absent. Could that be because the Secretary of Health and Human Services is a trial lawyer, perhaps? Defensive medicine adds $1,700 on average to a family policy. Now, I am not one to say that if a physician makes a mistake, if there's negligence, absolutely the patient needs to be compensated. I'm a patient. Somebody makes a mistake, I should be compensated. But there are better ways to do it than through our current malpractice system. There are medical specialty courts that exist in some institutions where basically this court will determine the merit, they will calculate the money judgments, and there are caps on non-economic damages, and a loser pay system is very effective to keeping frivolous lawsuits from further draining our system. Medical specialty societies, not IPAD, should determine what the best care is. Next slide. Health insurance. 
It wasn't tied to being employed until World War II, when there's only so many folks out there working, and there are caps on what could be paid, and so an additional way to bring a gainful person to your employ was to offer them health insurance. Health insurance is not sold in a true free market like auto insurance. It's heavily regulated by states, burdened by these mandates, and these mandates and these regulations drive costs up. These costs are not transparent. And this is where I say, you know, doctors are, you know, have shared point in the responsibility. Somebody comes to me and they have a broken wrist, and they say, how much is it going to cost? I should be able to tell them how much it's going to cost. I shouldn't have to say, it depends on your health insurance. I don't really know. I'm just here to treat you. Let me give you the CPT code and you go talk to our financial counselor. But costs should be transparent. Absolutely. True insurance. It covers the risk of catastrophic loss. What we have right now is prepaid health care, not health insurance. Health, true health insurance should cover catastrophic loss, like your house were to burn down. Entities such as health savings accounts, where it puts the patient in charge of your own money and your own policy, and your policy doesn't answer to your employer, it answers to you, is better. And we should have policies that are sold across state lines, so it's portable. When you move, it goes with you. It should not be determined on the basis of your employment. Is this addressed? We know the answer, no. Next. So true insurance reform would eliminate the interstate restrictions to the sale of health insurance, give the same tax breaks to individuals as are given to employers, create high risk pools for pre-existing illnesses, allow small businesses and individuals to pool their risk, and incorporate the increased use of health savings accounts. Next. As you all know, health insurance, uh, HSA, do all of you all know, know what HSAs are? Anybody not? Okay, so you, ba you basically take some of your money, put it in a tax-free account, you use that money to pay for the smaller expenses, and you leave your high deductible, low premium insurance to cover the catastrophic medical, medical events. And this brings direct incentives to patients and consumers to help control costs. So if you come to my office and you've got a risk ganglion and for some reason we want to order an MRI, if the place down the street offers it for a grand less rather than the one two miles away, well you should be able to get it wherever it's least expensive. Next slide. It's been demonstrated that in HSAs the quality of care is maintained this enhances consumer choice, unlike PPACA, where your consumer choice is limited, and it's our money, we keep what we don't use. And this has been shown to decrease health care costs, costs across the board. There's actually a, a Mackinac Center for Public Policy that estimated that $200 billion a year would be saved. Next. Last thing. Patients, me included, need to take a healthy dose of personal responsibility. We lead the world in so many great things. We also lead the world in some not so great things. Examples, <laughs> obesity, tobacco, and um, alcohol use. They cost a lot of money to take care of the sequelae of those. Next. Now, when you look at the determinants of individual slash early death, 40% are due to lifestyle and behavior. We could address a lot of those through those top three things, obesity, tobacco, and alcohol use. 30% genetic makeup. I can't change that as a physician. You can't change that as a patient. We just gotta deal with what we're, what we're dealt. 20% due to social and economic, and only 10% of early death has been linked to lack of access to medical care. Next slide. Promises versus reality. Barack Obama told us that the average family premium would go, back, go down $2,500. It's actually gone up $2,100. That's a spread of almost $5,000. And, and, and actually, uh, Mr. Johnson grilled Kathleen Sebelius about this on Wednesday. She didn't say anything. Well, it hasn't been fully implemented yet. No answer. <clears throat> we were told it was going to cost $938 billion. That's been revised. 2.5 trillion. 
And in March of 2010, we were told that the debt would decrease $138 billion as a result of the cost controls that are implemented with Obamacare. Two months later, that was changed. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. The for former CBO director said the debt actually is going to increase $554 billion the first 10 years, and then $1.4 trillion the second 10 years. Next slide. So, if Obamacare is let, allowed to come to its full uh, fruition, we will all have a health insurance card, but we will have decreased access. We will have decreased choice. We will have decreased quality. We will have increased wait time. And we will have increased cost and rationing. Next slide. So, I'm going to end in the next two minutes. Go. Please. What can we do? Get involved. I'm speaking to the choir here. Y'all wouldn't be here if you weren't involved. If you're interested in some of the things I said, you can look into docsforpatientcare.org, and I've got some of the information out there. They've got wonderful information that comes out, a wonderful video series that just came out. There's downloads that are, you can download some little paperwork to give to your doctor, try to draw them in, the docs for patient care. We are like herding cats. Getting physicians together to agree on an issue is like herding cats. And if y'all can help draw your physicians in, it's only going to make the cause for all of us better. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we are up against big, big money. And it's going to take big money to defeat Obamacare, to repeal and replace it. So give money. Give money to Ken. Yeah. <laughs> to the Republican Party. To veto and Rockwell's construction. <laughs> <laughs> to, to whatever candidate you deem most appropriate. You can give money to docs for patient care. You can give money to the Tea Party. Make a difference. Get involved. Give money. Educate your friends. And of course, vote. Thank you. All right, before we begin.